Good evening, ladies. Good evening. Yay, happy Monday. <laughs> oh, you all laughed. That's a good sign, right? Um, thank you all for coming. It is so good to see actually new faces tonight and all kinds of familiar faces. I am so glad. I know I say this every week and I will say it every week that I'm here. I am so glad that you all are taking this journey with me and I'm not wandering through the desert by myself. So um, before we start in here on Monday nights, the leadership team gets together and we pray. And I just want you ladies to know that it is an honor to pray over you every week. And tonight it was kind of neat because I had not told any of the the leadership, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And one of the gals prayed, oh, Lord, we want for every single person here tonight to experience you intimately. And I just smiled because that is exactly what we're talking about tonight. And you tell me God is not pleased that we are all here and we are all on the same page. And I am so honored to take you all along with me on this journey. I'm just, I'm thrilled. Did I say that already? I am thrilled that you all are here. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to do. I just wanted to start tonight and just remind you all why I do what I do. I promise you it is not to show up and hear myself talk. I've heard myself talk. I feel like I owe you all an apology. I can hear me. Thank you for sticking with it. But listen, ladies, I am here because I desperately love Jesus. Desperately. And I want him more and more and more. And I want that for you all. I want you all to encounter him on an intimate level. And he, here's the good news. He wants that. I believe we said for the past couple of weeks that God sees us and he hears us, but he not only sees and hears us, he wants to be seen and he wants to be heard. That's amazing news. I pray that you all will hear him tonight. God not only speaks to be heard, he speaks to be obeyed. And that's where we're going tonight. Um, here's the statement that you might wanna write down because it kind of blankets our whole evening. Obedience to God always precedes intimacy with God. Obedience to God always precedes intimacy with God. Here's the good news. God doesn't force us to be obedient. He never forces us to be obedient. We can most certainly go our own way. Maybe some of you all are like me. I bet all of you are like me at some point in your life and you have gone your own way. My own way has led to severe depression, anxiety, bitterness, um, anger, a chronic emptiness of soul and a complete total uh, lack of my mission and my purpose in life. Anybody relate? Okay, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to go my own way anymore. I just don't. I've been there, done that, don't want to do it again. I really do want to go God's way. Y'all want to go God's way? Okay, it requires obedience. And it's a good sign that nobody got up and ran out yet because this is sort of a lesson on obedience. Y'all game? You look like your game. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's do a quick recap of our homework this week. I hope and I hope and I hope and I pray that you all are doing your homework. This week we um, went through part of the, the temple and the tabernacle. So if you have not got a chance to do that, please, please, please go back and do it. Especially the lesson on the altar of burnt offering. Did you all get that far? It is imperative that you all understand the purpose of the altar of burnt offering not just for this study, but for life in general. We have to understand and grasp the importance of the sacrificial system and how it pointed to Christ. Were you all stunned at how God is so interested in the details of our lives? Did you get that from studying this? One of my favorite verses of all time is Psalm 3723 in the New Living Translation version. And it says, the steps of the godly are directed by the Lord. He delights in every detail of their lives. Isn't that fun? Love that verse. Okay, so we studied the gate, right? And you came to the altar of burnt offering and the bronze laver. Hey, I free handed this, so do not measure it when class is over. I don't know if it's right or not. Okay, just work with me here. So then we came in and we studied the lampstand and the table of the bread of the presence. And we ended with the altar of incense, right? Y'all with me? Just nod like you are, even if you didn't do homework, just to make me feel better. Okay, then what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna go through the curtain or the veil and we're gonna look at the Ark of the Covenant. 
All right, so let's pray before we get started. Just a quick prayer. God Almighty, you are welcome in this place already. Lord, I know that you are here. I pray, Jesus, that you will open our minds and our hearts and that you will pierce us with your truth, that you will give us such a hunger, Lord, to enter into um, a deeper, more intimate relationship with you. You created us to enjoy your presence, Lord, and that's what we want to do tonight. I love you and I worship you. It's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. Okay, so here we go. Let's start with the veil or the curtain. And you're going to want to look with me in Exodus 26, verses 31 through 33. 26, 31 through 33. I hear an echo. <laughs> 26, 31. Make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into it by a skilled craftsman. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasp and place the Ark of the Testimony behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. That was the main function of the curtain that hung here. Okay, every single day, the priest would, they would alter the sacrifices, they would wash in the bronze laver, and then they would do their services um, in the holy place. I wanna call it something besides services, but I can't think of a word right now. Okay, y'all can't either. Okay, so we'll go with it. So this is where they served. That's what I want to say. That is services, right? They served in the holy place. So every single day they would see the curtain that separated them from the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant was where, and we'll study this in just a second, where um, the presence, the literal presence of God was. But they could not go past that curtain except once a year on the Day of Atonement, which is a fascinating lesson that we will study together uh, in just a couple of weeks. I'm super excited about that one too. Okay, so every day the priest would see this reminder and know that they could not go past it. So it made me wonder, Every day, were they looking and waiting and yearning for that one day where they would get to be literally, don't forget this, this was a literal thing, literally in the presence of God. Did they yearn for that? Did they want that? And the more I thought about it and the more I thought about it, I wondered, Lord, do I have anything in my house or anything in my life right now that makes me yearn for that time for you? When I was thinking about it, it reminded me of a story that I've heard from Francis Chan. Are you all familiar with Francis Chan? He wrote an awesome book called Crazy Love. Um, another book that he wrote too called Forgotten God on the Holy Spirit. Phenomenal. Read it if you get a chance. So he was telling a story once about his wife's grandmother, and he said she was the most godly woman that he had ever met. And she just, oh, just loved Jesus with such a passion that it made him want to love Jesus more. And he said that um, they took her to a play once and during intermission he turned to her and said, Grandma, are you having a good time? And she said, well, I guess, but I, what if Jesus comes back while we're here? I think I would rather be at home praying. Can you even imagine? I know, right? I don't know anybody like that. And he said she had this special place at the foot of her bed where every morning she would get up and she would just spend time with Jesus and just sing praise songs to him and just love on him. And just, she did it every single morning. And she said during the day, if she happened to walk by that spot at the foot of her bed, she'd say, oh, I can't wait till tomorrow morning when I get to be with Jesus again, right there. I want that. I want to want him more than I want my next breath. Don't you all? Here's the fun thing. God desires that with us. He wants that. He makes himself available for that. Okay, let's keep going. On the other side of the curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. And turn with me to Exodus 25. And we'll be looking at 10 through 16.
25, 10 through 16. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark of the testimony, which I will give you." Okay, so the ark of the covenant. Seriously, I've got to get something to wet my throat. Okay. The Ark of the Covenant. Um, from my studies, because I don't know what a cubit is, y'all probably don't either, I'm guessing, unless you're just really smart. Uh, they said that it was about four feet long and about two feet wide and high. So this wasn't that big of a piece of a furniture. And later on, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, we read that it would hold the Ten Commandments, it would hold a jar of manna, and it would hold Aaron's staff that budded, which I believe you will study in your homework. I don't think you've got there yet, but you'll get there. So these three things were meant to do what? They were meant to remind the Israelites of who their God was. Remember that whole remember thing that just runs straight through Scripture, especially the study? It is so important, you all know this by now, that, that we remember who our God is. Right? Okay, let's pay attention to the lid or the cover on the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, look in 25 still, and we're going to be in 17 through 22. Okay, so this was the cover on the Ark. Make an atonement cover. Some of your versions might say mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put the ark of the testimony, which I will give you. There, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Fascinating. Okay, let's look at the Hebrew definition for atonement cover. The Hebrew word for atonement is kafar. <laughs> I have to laugh. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce it, but it sounds good. So if any of you all are Hebrew or Greek scholars and I am butchering this, you can come tell me later. Okay, it's K-A-P-H-A-R. Here's what it means. It means to cover, purge, make an atonement, reconciliation, to cover over, forgive, or appease. Now in the Greek, and here's what you all need to understand about the Greek, some of you may already know this, uh, there is a Greek translation of the old Hebrew scriptures and it's called the Septuagint. So when they translated the Hebrew into the Greek, they translated atonement as propitiation. And here's what that one means, this is so important. It's the act of appeasing another person's anger by the offering of a gift. Okay, so here's what we're looking at. Literally, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, it was the place where God's wrath against sin was appeased by the blood of a perfect sacrifice one time a year. Did you all get that? Fascinating. Okay, listen to verse 22 again. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the Ark of the Testimony, I will meet with you. Take that very literally. Okay, one more fun thing that I want you to see. Um, I can read it, you don't have to turn there, but it's in Numbers 7, verse 89. I just thought this was fun. Number seven, verse 89, when Moses entered the tent of meeting, which is the Holy of Holies, to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Testimony, and he spoke with him. Okay, are y'all getting that? I, I, I wanna revert back to last week and go, do you believe that? Can you believe that? So literally speaking to God above the atonement cover, in the Holy of Holies. Isn't that fascinating? 
blows my ever-loving mind. Okay, now look at Exodus 29. Y'all got to see this. Verses 42 and 43. Okay, now we're talking about the altar of burnt offering, okay? For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet with you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by my glory. Here's what I want you all to see. This is awesome. Okay, check it out. God just got through saying, I will meet with you here at the altar of burnt offering. I will meet with you here at the mercy seat. Do you see it? We cannot have intimacy with God until we first meet Him at the place of sacrifice. Isn't that awesome? Pretty cool. Let that one sink in for a minute, because it's really awesome. Obedience to God always precedes intimacy with God. Always. Okay. Let us recap where the Israelites are right now. Here's where we are. Uh, Moses got the whole blueprint for the tabernacle while he was on top of the mountain. And y'all remember a something, little something going on at the bottom of the mountain from last week's lesson, right? So Moses has got the whole um, Ten Commandments. He's got the blueprint for the tabernacle. And he comes down the mountain and, whoa, what the heck is going on down here? Okay, so after he got that mess hall taken care of, it was time to build the furniture for the tabernacle. It was time to build the tabernacle, and then we are ready to go. Okay, that was a little ways later. So actually, we are at the first month, first day, second year. We've been in the desert with the Israelites for a whole year. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Okay, here's where we're going. Let's see, uh, look at Exodus 40. So we're at the moment when all of this is getting set up. And I'm going to start in, or on, verse 17, Exodus 40. Is everybody there? Because I need your help with this one. Exodus 40, beginning 17. Okay, the verses that I'm getting ready to read, it takes us quickly through the setting up of the tabernacle. Moses was the one that went in and set everything up. And there is a key phrase that I want you all to say with me when I get to it. And that key phrase is, as the Lord commanded him. We game? Ready? Let's go through it pretty quick. Pay attention to the different furniture and everything that's being set up. It's just so much fun. Okay, verse 17. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the post. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. He took the testimony and placed it in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and shielded the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain and set out the bread on it before the Lord. As the Lord he placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord. As the Lord came. Moses placed the gold altar, altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it. As the Lord came. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings. As the Lord he placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar. The then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain as the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Verse 34 then, everybody say then. then, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Do you all remember last week us talking about the cloud and the presence of God? Can you even imagine this? Okay, God filled the Holy of Holies 
with the cloud. His presence literally filled it as a result of their obedience. Did you catch it? Intimacy with God is always preceded by obedience. After the tabernacle was set up, the presence of the Lord filled the Holy of Holies. Then the priests were ready to start their ministry. Seven whole days of um, ordination had to take place, and on the eighth day, they were ready to start their work. So turn with me, I want you to see this, to Leviticus chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. Wouldn't you? Isn't that fascinating? I have to do I can't help myself. Do you believe it? Isn't that amazing? Okay, um, let's see, what do I want to do, what I want to do? Okay, quick history lesson. So the tabernacle was set up, and this followed the Israelites for the 40 years through the desert, and it was in working uh, condition, I guess, for another 480 years until about the time of King David. King David's son, Solomon, came on the scene and he built a permanent temple. Okay, what we're going to do in this lesson tonight is we are going to look at the significant movements of God's presence. Uh, God's presence was not continuously in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle for that 480 years. There was quite a bit of uh, rebellion and some other things that went on. But for the most part, um, God's presence, Holy of Holies, now the temple was being built. I want you to see what happens, and it's very, very similar to what happened when the tabernacle was set up. Okay, look in 2 Chronicles. Chapter 5, and I'm going to read quickly verses 7, 11, and the last part of 13. But this is when everything is finished and the temple is getting ready to be dedicated. Verse 7, Then the priest brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. All this sounds familiar to you by now. Verse 11, The priest then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. Do you remember us talking about consecrating ourselves, setting ourselves apart as holy unto God? Okay, now look at the last part of 13. I'll just read 13. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison. They were celebrating as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Sound familiar? He did it again. He always responds to obedience. Always, always. Obedience always precedes intimacy with God. Okay, Solomon prays a very long prayer. You can read it if you want to. It's pretty good. Okay, chapter 7. I want you all to see what happens here too. I'll start in verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, here we go, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. I'll say it again. Obedience always precedes intimacy. Always. Okay, I wish that I could stop the lesson right there and whoo, everything's great forever. N not so much. Um, I don't want to ruin it for you, but Israel didn't exactly stay obedient to God. Um, actually, for very long, it's kind of sad. So fast forward many years and the nation of Israel actually split. Uh, the northern part was called Israel and the southern part was called Judah. 
the northern part was taken captive by the Assyrians and the southern part fell later to the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar some years later. This happened because they were no longer obedient to God. They turned their backs on the living God. It's hard for me to even fathom this after everything that they had seen and followed after false gods. Kind of studied that a bit, a little bit last week, right? Okay, while they were in exile, there was a prophet by the name of Ezekiel, and God showed him this amazing vision of his presence and it leaving the temple. And I want you all to see it. I'll go through it pretty fast, but this is fascinating to me. Okay, flip over to Ezekiel. It's one of the books kind of toward the end of the Old Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 10. In chapter 8, it tells us that when uh, God came and took Ezekiel um, by vision, he took them back to Jerusalem and showed him the temple. And Ezekiel saw all of these false idols literally set up in the temple of God and the Israelites just blatantly worshiping idols in God's holy temple. Not, not really a good idea. Um, verse 12, I believe, in chapter 8. Let me make sure that's right. Yes, one of the things that the people would say is, the Lord does not see us. What? Okay, how many times have we said in this study, the Lord sees you and he hears you. And one of the things that they had started saying was, the Lord does not see us. Ooh, ladies, be careful. When you are in the desert, one of the first things the enemy likes to do is twist the words of God. It is so important that you know what the word of God says. That was not true. You bet God saw what they were doing. That's why God's presence left the temple. Okay, look with me in chapter 10, and I'll read the first couple of verses. I looked, this is Ezekiel, and I saw the likeness of a throne of sapphire above the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And as I watched, he went in. Okay, reading uh, visions like this can be a little daunting. Um, I frankly don't understand it myself. Remember, I read commentaries. <laughs> it's amazing what you can learn when you read a commentary. Okay, so the coals that are spread out over the city, which would be the city of Jerusalem, speaks of the judgment of God. We'll just kind of leave it with that. That's what I needed to understand. Okay, verse 3. Now the cherubim, okay, check this out though. The cherubim that Ezekiel was seeing, uh, literally the cherubim, like not the gold ones over the Ark of the Covenant, like he was seeing the for real deal. Do you all remember, was that in your homework this week where you studied? Okay, it was in this chapter. Oh, can you imagine seeing that? Just freak you out just a little bit. Okay, now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in. Here we go. And a cloud filled the inner court. Okay, so Ezekiel is already starting to see his, his vision here, and he's seeing the cloud out fill the Holy of Holies, right? Okay. This isn't a surprise. Now, chapter, uh, verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. Okay, so here's what he's seeing now. The cloud is filled in the Holy of Holies. This is in the vision, remember? It moves from here to here. Okay? That's, that's attractive, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Um, flip over to verse 18. Make sure I don't leave anything out. Yeah, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Okay, so we move from here to here to the entrance. And isn't it interesting, I noticed um, today, actually, that God still refers to himself as the God of Israel. Isn't that something? With everything going on, they got idols set up all over the place of his temple. But he's still referred to as the God of Israel. He never changes. We're the ones that change. Okay, so the glory of God, literally the presence of God, is at the entrance of the temple now. Okay, look in chapter 11. Verse 22, 
Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. What you're seeing here is a complete departure of the glory of God from the temple. And he went all the way over to actually what is the Mount of Olives. Isn't that fascinating? It's fascinating to us, but let me tell you all something. The Israelites, when Ezekiel came back from his vision and shared this with him, they would have been absolutely devastated. Where do we go if your presence does not go with us? What do we do now? They felt lost, as they should. Here's what I don't want you to forget. God never changes. He filled the tabernacle because of obedience. He left because of their disobedience. Obedience always precedes intimacy. Okay, so later on, the temple was rebuilt. When the exiles came back from captivity, they rebuilt the tabernacle, or they rebuilt the temple. Nowhere in Scripture ever again do we read that God's presence filled the tabernacle or the temple like He had before. Nowhere. It, it's just not there. Okay, so um, let's see what happens then. No scriptural evidence. Okay, years and years and years later, I'm leaving out many, many, many years. Uh, King Herod rebuilds the temple, and this is around the time of Christ. Again, we have absolutely no scriptural evidence that King Herod's temple was ever filled with the presence of God. Not ever. Until. Look with me in Luke. Luke chapter 2. Your fingers are getting a workout tonight. <laughs> Luke chapter 2. Verse 21 through 32. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Oh, ladies, we have a God that wants to be seen and he wants to be heard. The glory of God was no longer covered by a cloud. He was covered by flesh. And he walked in and out of that temple for 33 years, the literal presence of God. Let me read to you a very familiar verse, John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling. He tabernacled among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you believe it? Isn't that amazing? I could end right there, but I won't. I got more. Okay, let's look at the significance then, the New Testament significance, if you will, of the veil and the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, look with me in Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, 
He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Josephus, a historian that lived in the time of Christ, said that this veil that hung in Herod's temple was at least 90 feet high, and it was torn from top to bottom. Jesus, when he had the crown of thorns placed on his head, to the nails in his hands, to the beatings on his back and down his legs, to the nails in his feet, he was torn from top to bottom. Listen to Hebrews 10. Ten nineteen. Therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, the place of God's presence, you all know that by now, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Isn't God amazingly consistent from Genesis to Revelation? I love that. I love it. Jesus, you are amazing to me. Okay, mercy seat. Let's look at the mercy seat. This is very, very cool. Okay, we remember what the mercy seat was. I believe, let's see, let me quote what I said. Okay, the mercy seat is the place where God's wrath against sin was appeased by the blood of the perfect sacrifice. Remember, that's what happened at the mercy seat. Okay, Romans 3, 21 through 26. Paul, a very devout Jew and Hebrew, understood the significance of this. Listen to what he wrote, 321. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Here it is. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Do you see that phrase, sacrifice of atonement? When it's translated in the Old Testament in the Septuagint, guess what the phrase is? Mercy seat. Jesus is the mercy seat. Do you see it? Ooh, do you see it? Jesus was the point where God's wrath was turned away from us because it fell on him. He is our mercy seat. He is the atonement cover. Does that blow you all away? Oh God, me. Okay, so what happened after the death of Jesus? Remember, Jesus is the literal presence of God. He is the glory of God. What happens when Jesus died? Where's the glory of God? What happened? Look with me in Acts. I told y'all your fingers are gonna get a workout tonight. It's fun, isn't it? If you didn't know the books of the Bible before, maybe you will later, <laughs> by the end of the night. Okay, Acts 1. Verse 4. Okay, this is already after the crucifixion. Jesus walked on earth and talked with his disciples for a whole 40 days afterwards. And listen to what he tells them in verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Remember the cloud? Awesome. You come and you go. Okay. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Now let me start in verse 1, I'll end in 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Filled it. 
they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, do you hear it? It filled them. Just like God's presence filled the Holy of Holies, His Spirit filled the disciples and the believers. And it's not a coincidence that it showed up in tongues of fire. Do you remember the fire that came out from the presence of the Lord and devoured their offerings and their sacrifices? Are you familiar with Romans 12:1, where Paul says we're supposed to offer our bodies as living sacrifices? God's holy fire will consume us. I'm having a good time tonight. I'm having a good time. Okay, so when the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and the temple, where literally did he fill it? Literally. It was in the Holy of Holies, correct? It was literally in this place. It was in the Holy of Holies where God filled the temple. And actually that word filled, it can mean satisfied. Isn't that fun? God was satisfied with filling the Holy of Holies. Okay, now... Ooh, this is my favorite part of the lesson. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Y'all can make fun of me after this is over. <laughs> chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 19. Let me tell you this first. The holy of holies in the Greek is the word naos. And again, I'm probably butchering that, but it's N-A-O-S. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Guess what word is used for temple? Naos. It's the same word in the Old Testament for the Holy of Holies. Are you getting that? Oh my goodness, girls. Let that sink in. Do not miss this. If you hear me say anything tonight, you hear me say that. Your physical body is the Holy of Holies where God himself fills it. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. Don't forget that you serve a God that wants to be seen and he wants to be heard. Obedience always precedes intimacy. Let's wrap this up. John 14, starting in verse 15 through 21. Jesus speaking, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. I want you to hear the definition of show. This is awesome. It means to manifest, exhibit to view, to appear, declare, make known, appear plainly, to render evident to the mind, to manifest to the sight, to make visible. Jesus wants to be seen and he wants to be heard. <gasps> blows me away every time. And I've gone over this like a hundred times and still it blows me away. He, do you hear what he's telling you? If we are obedient to him, 
we will see him. We will see him with our eyes. Okay. Yes, we will see him move among us. We will see him work in the lives, um, our lives and our families' lives and those lives that we are praying with. Absolutely, that is a way to see Jesus. But I think he means more than that, just that. One day, our literal eyes will see him. He wants to be seen. Whew. Okay, so obedience precedes intimacy. One of my goals tonight was to encourage you ladies to remember who your God is, to remember that He desires more intimacy with you. He desires that time with you. He wants your attention. He wants your praise. Listen, not for His benefit, for our benefit. Remember, He is the only one that can fully satisfy, right? You study the bread yet? Satisfaction? Good stuff. Okay. I could, I thought about turning this lesson into an, um, just a, a hardcore obedience lesson and start talking about how we need to start confessing our sin and um, repenting. And hey, I'm all about that. It is a beautiful thing. But you know what? It is not my job. It is never my job to convict you of your all sin. Guess whose job that is? That would be the Holy Spirit living in you. He will lead you to confess what you need to confess. And frankly, if you want to stay in the desert a little bit longer, a great way to do that is to not confess and to not <laughs> repent. So if you're kind of digging the dryness and the, um, the dust, if you like that, then by all means, hang on to your pet sin. But if you want to be intimate with your God, if you want that, oh, and if you crave that intimacy with Him, Obey Him. Obedience always precedes intimacy. This week when I was preparing this lesson, I set one day aside and I began how I usually do. Lord, I want you to reveal yourself to me. I want you to speak to me. And He usually speaks to me through His Word. 99% of the time when God speaks to you, it will be off the pages of Scripture because God's Word is alive and active. That's how He communicates to us most of the time. And if um, ever at a time someone comes to say to you, hey, God told me to tell you something, unless He told me that you were going to tell me, then probably not. Or if it's not in line with what is written in God's Word, then you need to pitch it out the nearest window. Okay, I just threw that in there. That's a bonus. Okay, so on Wednesday was the day that I had set aside, and I um, started my day by praying, Lord, I just I want you to speak to me. I just, I was really craving that, um, that intimacy with my Savior, just those sweet moments that can only come from Him. And so I began reading and I began studying and, and I knew that this was going to be a, a lesson kind of geared toward obedience and how intimacy with God um, always comes as a result from us being obedient, right? And to be honest with you all, I'm not going to lie, I was feeling pretty good about my obedience. I think I told you all the first night, I am doing things that I never dreamed in a million years that I would ever do. And I know that it's because God has wanted me to do that. So I've been obedient. So frankly, I was feeling pretty good about my obedience level. I haven't always been comfortable with everything that God's asked me to do. That is a major understatement, but I've done it. So I've gotten a little bit uh, used to it. I should say that used to it, not comfortable with it. But you know, okay, I've got this obedience thing down. So I'm reading God's word, feeling good. I got a phone call. I didn't see this one coming. A few years ago, um, without sharing too much detail, God had made it pretty doggone clear to me that there were some things that He wanted me to do. I wasn't crazy about it, but at the time it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I said, okay, Lord, here's, here's the deal. I'll cut a deal with you. You're great. God's, <laughs> we can do this my way or we can do it my way. Okay, so my little deal in my mind that made me feel better about it was, okay, Lord, um, I will not seek this out for myself. But if you um, have someone ask me to do it, then I'll do it. You got me. Okay. I felt okay about that because I really didn't see where it would actually come to fruition. You know what I mean? A few times it's happened. Okay. Um, but it, it's been a while. So I hadn't even thought about it for a while. Well, I get this phone call out of the blue. Yeah, right. And I, I'm not kidding y'all. I struggled with this for hours. I mean, my first reaction is not one that I am proud of. It was kind of like a, I don't want to. I don't want to do this. I just flat don't want to. I don't want to. 
I, I threw a little pity party um, for most of the day. I run to the core, y'all. If Jesus was not in me, there would be no good in me whatsoever. When he finally got my attention, let's put it this way, when I finally started listening to the voice of God speak over me, here's what I heard him say. Paulette, didn't you ask to hear me speak to you today? Yes, Lord. Aren't you writing a lesson on obedience? Yes, Lord. Did you forget your first lesson when I told Moses that I will be with you? Yes, Lord. You're giving me the same argument that Moses gave you. Lord, I can't speak. Have you forgotten already? I will be with you and teach you what to say. The literal Hebrew translation for that is, I will be with your mouth. Yes, Lord. The moments following that, when I finally realized that I had taken my eyes off God and put them on me, I had to hit my knees in repentance. And let me tell you all something. Those were the sweetest moments of intimacy that I have had in a long time. I'm not jumping up and down that I get to do what he's called me to do, but he's warming me up to it a little bit because you know what? Saying no is not worth it. I want that relationship with my Jesus. Y'all, I want that for you all. Every single one of you all in here, God desires for you to step it up a notch. What intimate moments, what joy, what absolute fulfillment are you missing out on because you're not being obedient in an area in your life? You need to just lay it down. Don't miss it. Obedience always precedes intimacy with God. Love you, ladies. Let's pray. Lord, your word has been spoken tonight. You never cease to amaze me. You are so consistent. And God, just like you filled the Holy of Holies with your presence, Lord, you fill us literally with your Holy Spirit. God, open our ears that we would hear you. And Lord, give us the gift of a willing, obedient, and surrendered spirit to you tonight. Oh, the sweetness of fellowship and intimacy with you, Lord Jesus. There is nothing like it on the planet. You are so worth it. We love you and we praise you. In your holy name that I pray. Amen.